everything that happened to his baseball team last night, understandably so. And I, you know, we were talking about whether Nashville roots for Mookie Betts, even though he plays or has played for two of the most hateable <laughs> franchises in all of baseball between the Red Sox and now the L.A. Dodgers. So Ed from Lebanon would like to weigh in on Mookie Betts as we continue that conversation before we pivot to some Titan stuff. What's up, Ed? Uh, so I heard you guys uh, talking about people giving Mookie a hard time about being a Dodger. Well, I just want to tell you a little story. It's not his fault, but he's come full circle. So um, I was Mookie Betts' baseball coach for the first five years he played ball. He was a um, big shortstop and led off for me. And um, the very, I was a huge Dodger fan. So when he came, when his mom brought him to me to play for me, we were the Dodgers. And so it was just destiny that he ended up a Dodger. No, it's uh, it's. I, I don't think people are giving him a hard time about playing for the Dodgers. Well, I guess they are giving him a hard time about playing for the Dodgers. I think they're just giving him a hard time because he doesn't play for their team, right? It's like Tom Brady. He gets welcomed when he re-enters Gillette Stadium initially, and then when the offense takes the first drive out on the field, they boo. I think that's cool. As someone who has no strong feelings towards any team in Major League Baseball, love or hate, I think that's really cool. That people, that he's advancing? No, just the whole, the, what Ed just said, full circle. Oh, yeah. No, I think there's some symbolism to that. I mean, you can find a lot of those stories throughout sports. It's why people love sports, right? It's the, it's the, the storytelling element of it and the heights that these individuals are able to achieve. That's why you kind of, you know, you follow it. As a fan, it becomes a part of your story because you have moments that are attached to those moments, right? When you, whether you're watching on TV, whether you're in the stands, whether you go back to Mookie Betts as a prospect coming out and you're like, oh, you're watching this kid for the first time and you're like, wow, that guy's special. I think it's a pretty cool moment to have. 615-737-1045. So let's talk, let's talk quickly before we get to Jeremy McNichols about the Tennessee Titans and what's happening with their pass protection right now. So I was reading John Glennon of Sports Illustrated and the drop-off that the Titans offensive line has had. Now, they were sacked quarterbacks for the Titans last year, which was just really Ryan Tannehill, sacked a career low 24 times over 16 games. 4.8% of the time was Ryan T that Ryan Tannehill dropped back. He was getting sacked, lowest of his career. It's great why the Titans looked the way they did because the quarterback couldn't be touched now what's happening with Ryan Tannehill over four games he leads the NFL with 17 after the Jets put seven on them on Sunday his sack percentage has more than doubled it's up to 10.1 percent of the time which is the second highest percentage since he's been in the NFL nine total years now, Vrabel, when, we, when he was asked about it, put it, kind of spread the blame about, right? Wide receivers can't get separation. Quarterbacks holding on to the ball. We got to pass protect better. We got to coach better, right? Coach better, play better. Titans fans love that line. But when you look at the numbers realistically, the offensive line seems to bear the brunt of the blame at this point. 72 sacks he's on pace for right now, Ryan Tannehill. That can't happen. The offensive line with Taylor Lewan, Roger Saffold, Ben Jones, Nate Davis, all four of those guys are back. David Questenberry, a new addition, not a new addition. He's been with the team for a while, but the new starting right tackle. You didn't necessarily think that it was going to fall off a cliff, that it was going to crater the way that it has. They have allowed 164 pressures on dropbacks. This is per pro football focus. Johnny wrote this up at Sports Illustrated. An average of about 10 a game. Titans have allowed 60 pressure dropbacks, an average of about 15 per game, a 50% increase year over year. That's unacceptable. So when, you know, because Slay was in the in the chat earlier on YouTube, Ron Slay of 3HL, 3-6 to six on 104.5 The Zone. He was talking about, yeah, this guy, Jalen Fly Sadler, isn't going to get a chance. And and I agree with him. If, if Jalen was on the Titans' radar in a legitimate way, they would have made an effort, given that he's literally just standing across the street. It is telling their perception of him and the talent on the roster. This is, you know, this does not to make this sound like a personal attack. It's a cool story. But he's had some interactions with NFL teams, none of them, 
have been the Titans at this point. So you kind of get the gauge of what they're thinking. But also, they need something. Something is not right here. Now, it can be that Taylor Lewan is recovering from an ACL. Somebody make the Nate Davis thing make sense to me because his production, his ability, he looks lost out there. And I don't know if that's Dennis Kelly not being alongside him because there's really no no explanation. I did have somebody ask me on Instagram the other day whether it was COVID-related, right? Because him and Ben Jones both came off the COVID list ahead of week one. And we have seen athletes' production, some, dip or or their abilities be limited after dealing with COVID. We don't know the extent of Nate Davis' symptoms. You just look at guys like Miles Garrett, who is coming, who is having an incredible year, but did struggle last year after coming off the COVID list. Jalen, uh, not Jalen, I almost called him Jalen Hurd. That's not right. Jalen, uh, oh, the Celtics, the Celtics uh, shooting guard. I'm blanking on his name. This is driving me crazy. He uses an inhaler now. This is madness to me. Lucas, help me out. Who is the player for the Boston Celtics? Stud, I can't place it. Jalen Brown. Jalen Brown. No, but it's, is it Jalen Brown? Damn. <laughs> Damn. I had this whole thing, but he has an inhaler now, right? You, you use an inhaler now, right? After having deal, dealt with COVID. I don't, I don't have to use it that much anymore. Or but you there did was, use an inhaler. Yeah, there, I still have it, but there was a stretch of months there after I had COVID. It was December 2020, where for about six months from time to time, I would just have to take a couple puffs. Jason Tatum, what the hell is wrong with Oh, me? my God. How bad is that? <laughs> What are you laughing about? There is a Jalen Brown on the Celtics. There is a Jalen Brown on the Celtics. That is correct. But, oh, like, Jason man. Tatum is a star player. For yes. One of the NBA's no, he is biggest. a bona fide star. All right, that's, <laughs> that's not great. What are you like, laughing about? You you weren't giving me anything. No, no. I was I was in the same boat with you. But you were working off Jalen, so that's not – that's my bad. Um, Cam Newton, though, another one of these athletes. So, I don't know what's happening with Nate Davis. All I know is that I can't explain it. Point being – the Titans are getting the Tannehill's getting battered around back there. But now listen to Greg Cosell. We did the install yesterday. Listen to Greg Cosell talk about Ryan Tannehill because I I'm out here, you know, fighting the good fight against these anti Tannehill truthers about him holding the ball. And I, I listen, I'm not saying that Ryan Tannehill's perfect. And this article that Rich Samini of ESPN wrote about what CJ Mosley was doing to combat Tannehill at the line of scrimmage as the Jets inside linebacker was pretty interesting too. But listen to Greg Cosell kind of diagnose what was happening with some of the seven sacks that Ryan Tannehill ended up taking against New York. One other point I'd make, there were obviously seven sacks. Five of them came on third down. Yeah. Um, a couple of those sacks were on Tannehill, not on the offensive line, where the ball, he had a throw within the timing and structure of the play design. And for whatever reason, only he can answer this. I can't answer it. But he can, and he he just didn't turn it loose. Um, and then then he would get he got sacked because keep this in mind when you call quick game throws, meaning three step drop timing, even if it's from the gun, the t- timing of of the drops and routes is still three step, five stop, five step, seven step. It just maps out a little differently because the quarterback's in the gun, but the timing is still the same. So if you have a three-step timing throw, that's not a a full field read. That's not, hey, let's look here, then come back here. No, that's not the the design of that kind of play. So the ball has to come out. And I think there were two of them in which the ball should have come out. And if the ball doesn't come out because it's not a read per se, the quarterback gets stuck. And he got stuck twice, if I'm not mistaken. So – I mean, listen, what what Cosell is saying, yeah, Ryan Tannehill wasn't perfect either, but the problem is he has to be if everything else around him is going this poorly. Protection, separation, you heard Vrabel yesterday say the wide receivers need to be more physical at the point of the attack. That's, hey, that's, that's Julio Jones and A.J. Brown's M.O. That's what they are. Play strength, play speed. That's what those guys are able to do. Those are traits that you can assign to those two players. But Ryan Tannehill right now needs to be perfect, and if he's not then your margin for error, as we've talked about so many different times with all the things that are happening right now with the Titans, it's just too thin for him not to be. We'll continue this conversation coming up next. Titans running back Jeremy McNichols will join us uh, and uh, and we'll get into a conversation about what's, 
one thing that's substantially improved about the Titans offense in the passing game. Explosive plays aren't there, but one thing has made an emergence in a way that's clear and obvious to everybody. Titans running back Jeremy McNichols coming up next on 104.5 The Zone. The NFC West starts your NFL weekend as the Rams are at the Seahawks. Coverage starts tonight at 7 on your home for Thursday night football. 104.5 The Zone.
fresh off the practice field. So uh, I, we'll we'll talk about you know the success that you've been able to have in this offense and kind of how you've carved out this role for yourself. But I, I, I got to ask you first and foremost: Are you aware of the nickname that fans have given you of Jeremy McWeapon? Is has this come across your Twitter timeline? Have you seen this yet? Yeah, I've seen it. Uh, they they've been calling me. They've been saying that since college at Boise. All right, who's think, who's the uh, first person at Boise State to call you Jeremy McWeapon? Uh, Mike Sanford. He was my OC uh, my freshman year at Boise State. So what what was what was the impetus for that? How what was the or? Can you tell us the origin story? Uh, so basically, I was playing. I came in at running back, and then I played, and then they switched me to receiver, and then um, they wind up burning my red shirt. And you know, Boise State, we always ran trick plays and all the funky plays yeah and uh one of the reporters i think was like oh he's a weapon on offense and then uh uh coach mike sanford was like oh make weapon goes and then it just took off on his own no uh, it's it's an outstanding it's an outstanding nickname you've got king henry and jeremy mcweapon in the backfield <laughs> it sounds like a pretty fearsome force yeah, I love it. So let, let's talk a little bit about the role you've been able to carve out for yourself here with the Titans. I mean, you've been in a variety of different places across your NFL career, and it's it's not like this is your first stint with the Titans. So what about this offense and the style of play kind of fits what it is that you do well? Um, I mean, I'm just here to just work hard. Um, like you said, carve a rollout and uh, just continue to help us win and continue just to play hard and um, whatever they ask me to do, just to do it the best that I can and as as fast as I can and just keep playing hard. So, so this, this offense is obviously predicated first and foremost on the run, but a lot of times when you're in there, it's obvious passing situations. Now, you've, you've done really well with the role that they've kind of – made for you and that you've kind of carved out yourself not just you know in your contributions on offense but on special teams is is this probably been the best fit for you or have have you kind of found that you're you're through once you started out in a certain role whether that's primarily special teams or just in third down obvious passing situations that you've been able to kind of show the coaching staff what more you can do yeah I mean I think the role that I do play um, on third downs um, getting the mix in there, you know, first, second down and playing special teams. I think that role, it's a great role. And, um, I'm just trying to start in my role and just continue to help us win and, uh, just continue to do the best I can, uh, whatever the coaches ask me, whatever the staff ask me and whatever we need on this team. Yeah, I, it's obviously something that, that you have had great success with. And no, it wasn't the outcome that you guys were looking for in New York on Sunday. But, I mean, you were able to find ways to exploit that defense. We, we kind of talked to you a little bit about this after the game, Jeremy. But just for the audience that didn't necessarily catch that, catch that post-game press conference, what were, the, what were they showing you defensively that allowed that screen pass that you guys kept running to be open? Um, they just kept dropping back on uh... – on, on those downs that we we were able to run those screens and uh we knew that some that they were gonna penetrate up field pretty quickly so just getting those screens behind them and um get in the yards we can you know but uh that just all goes back to the coaching staff calling great plays and the offensive line blocking and we just executing up and down the field the the screen passes for both you and Derek and and the other backs when when they're able to get involved in the offense that's something that it seems you guys have have seen a little bit more of in the last couple of games or at least this season from a year ago now i we've talked to Vrabel about this before and he's kind of brought up the idea well if you're if you're going to be a screen team you have to dedicate that practice time to being a screen team was there was there anything last yeah. year about how the schedule got just kind of mutated with COVID and the lack of practice time that you guys were able to have that that's allowed you to be or use that more as a weapon in your guys' arsenal on offense? Uh, I think we spent more time on it. I know me personally, I watched other backs across the league, and on uh, Coach Du showed us other backs across the league, just the successful ones that were able to uh, break off big runs, the Kamaras, you know, the McCaffreys, those type of guys out the backfield, and uh, just continue to use their their different techniques, and um, just continue to watch film on 
the team each week and just try to exploit it. But I think it's a great changeup in our offense. I mean, running the ball, passing the ball, boots, um, screens, that's just going to keep the defense off balance. Titans running back Jeremy McNichols is here with us on 104.5 The Zone. So the audience may not know Tony Dews like obviously you do and, and kind of what we get to observe at practice. Coach Dews is one of my favorite coaches to watch when you guys are out on the practice field, not just because you can hear him from three miles away, yeah. <laughs> but because of the creativity that he's working in with you guys in the drills. What What's he like to work with? Oh, he's great. I mean, every day he brings that, the same energy. Like, you're not going to get any other – Bad energy is it's all up tempo. It's all energy. Um, he's exi- excited always to come to work and um, me with our group of running backs. Which, I mean, we got a great group of guys, and I think he coaches the heck out of us. And he's always creating and and trying to find ways to get us better in in every phase. You know, on the field, off the field, just being a better person, whatever it may be. Um, he's there, and he's gonna he's there to help us every single day. Are are you guys ever like, hey, coach? You know, you don't you don't need to be like that loud. I'm li- I'm right here. Right next to you. Does that ever happen in like the in the meeting room? Yeah, we play with them a little bit. We like Tony. We all in the we all in the room, but no, nah, we love it. I mean, it's like I said, he just brings that joy and that happiness and that and that energy to us. So, well, I mean, whatever we got to do, whatever he has to do to help us win and for us to understand the concepts and continue to play hard. I mean, I'm I'm good with that. No question. Uh, so you're you're from Santa Margarita in California. You played for Snoop Dogg at his uh, youth football league, Snoop's Youth Football League in Los Angeles. Yeah. What 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 is that experience like? Yeah, I grew up, I grew up in Long Beach, California, and um, yeah, I mean Snoop always had a Pop Warner league uh, when I was growing up, and you know I still have friends and coaches I still talk to to this day like that are going to be lifelong friends because of it and I think it was a great opportunity for him just to give back to the community and give back to the youth um for for us because I mean a lot of those kids were able to go to college and he he was able to get a lot of those kids out of South Central LA Long Beach whatever hardship they may be going through out of those situations and, and help them get to college that you know, you may have never dreamed about, but it was pretty cool playing for him and him just coming to his practices and hearing his story and him bringing different, you know, celebrities or different um, guys to just come in and talk to us and give us hope. So, I mean, I think that really helped change my life and change my career. There's, there's no question about it. I mean, I'm, I'm always, uh, it's always so cool to see those kind of individuals that have made it to the the heights, the highest of heights in their profession, and still find ways to make sure that they're giving back to support others, as you're describing. I mean, how how I guess how I guess did it change your life specifically? How how did it affect kind of your trajectory? Do you think? Yeah, I mean, it gave me hope. Um, it gave me hope, and a lot of times kids can't really afford playing football and playing the fees to play football. So him even giving that opportunity to allow you to have pads and a helmet and maybe not pay as much or maybe do something else to get you some, some pads and a helmet and be able to play with, with your, with your peers. I mean, that changed my life. Cause I mean, I don't even think probably wouldn't have played football if that wasn't the case. Um, and then just, like I said, just bringing in role models, consistently and seeing the older guys being able to get scholarships and go to high school and graduate and, and have families and just be able to see those guys and um, look up to them and be able to reach out to them to this day. And whatever advice you might have needed, you know, when you were young and, and um, middle school, high school, whenever it may be, they were there. So I think that's that's the one of the ways that really changed my life and uh, with football on and off the field. Titans running back Jeremy McNichols is our guest here on 104.5. The Zone. So, I mean, you know, you know, he's playing the halftime show with Dr. Dre, with Kendrick, with Mary J. Blige. You hit him, up. and obviously, I think in a perfect situation, you want to be playing in that game. Yeah. But I mean, if if that yeah. if that may not, for whatever reason, become the case, you're going to hit him up and be like, "Hey, coach, I could use some tickets." I don't know, man. I'm just looking to be there. <laughs> I, mean, I want to be there. So, if we we we'll, we'll figure it out when. Uh, when we get there, but that'll be, that'll be cool. Like no doubt. So with, go to the so with, he performs. 
Yeah, with with the spot that that you guys are in right now, two and two. You know, I know that a lot externally is being made about this last game, whether that's overreactionary or not. Now you kind of have the opportunity to to further the distance between yourselves and everybody else in the AFC South with this opportunity coming up against the Jacksonville Jaguars. What what kind of I mean, I know you try to flush those performances and just move on to focus on this week's opponent, but are there any lessons that you can guys that you guys can kind of carry over from one week to the next given that the Jets and the Jags are kind of in a similar situation right now? Yeah, I think we just attack every week as one and no. Uh win or loss after twenty four hours we just we flush the game and we continue to get better. Um we fix the we continue to do the good and then you know things that need to be fixed, we can fix it throughout practice. But I think that's the mindset every week and we just if we just take it uh one game at a time, one and no at a time, I think we're gonna be where we wanna be by the end of the year. It's uh it's certainly gonna be interesting to watch and we've enjoyed watching you uh, participate on the field so far and all that you've done for this team. Jeremy McNichols, Titans running back, kind enough to give us some of his time after practice today. Jeremy, continued health and success, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing what you guys do on Sunday. Thank you, and thank you for having me. Interesting guy, Jeremy McNichols. Appreciate him giving us some time here on 104.5 The Zone. I, you know, I, I don't know what I expected him to say when I said, hey, you know, Snoop's playing a halftime show. You want, you want tickets if you're not playing? And I I mean, I would have said, hell yes. I would like to go see a Kendrick Lamar, Snoop Dogg, Dr. Dre, Mary J. Blige, all in one 12-minute concert at SoFi Stadium, but he was very diplomatic in his response. Now, I mean, that that question, though, about the screen game and the emphasis in tight, Titans running backs are getting receptions right now. We, we put this on a poll at Buck Rising just to kind of see if people could figure this out without looking it up. Who is leading the Titans right now in receptions? And who, Lucas, if you would mind pulling up the options that we gave to people, I believe we said Chester Rogers, Julio Jones, Jeremy McNichols, and Derrick Henry. Yes. Well, the answer is Jeremy McNichols is leading the Titans in receptions with 15. Derrick Henry is second on the team with 14 receptions. Trust, uh, Chester Rogers, 12. Julio Jones, 12. So I, I don't know if, if people just know this or if they looked it up before voting because it is majority 39% said McNichols leads the Titans, 20, uh, 35% said Henry, 20% Rogers, Julio said 6 who uh, 6% said Julio. Puka was honest, said she voted Chester Rogers without looking it up. I think that people probably looked it up. But, I, I mean, also for giving two of the running backs, it's a safe assumption that one of the running backs is going to be the answer, right? So maybe we gave away the game. But it's it's pretty interesting because we'll hear from Greg Cosell on their lack of explosive plays as an offense here in just a second. But I just texted my buddy Luke Worsham at A to Z Sports because Todd Downing's currently speaking to the media. I said, Luke, hey, quickly, can you ask Todd about the emphasis of the running backs in the passing game this year and how they've kind of focused on this screen game in particular because it was not there with this level of execution in 2020, as we've seen it take place in 2021, this is the Titans' offensive coordinator on that screen game. Uh, we certainly have put a commitment into trying to improve our timing and our spacing in the screen game. That, that was something that started this offseason, um, you know, in, in uh, April and May. But I, I think it's all complementary, right? We've got a lot of drop back pass, we've got a lot of chips, we've got a lot of, you know, things of that nature going on. And, and so having some counter punches off of that. Uh, is important and as I mentioned earlier you know that that to me is a way to to help when they're teeing off a little bit in pass rush um, you know that's a, that's a compliment to be able to try to slow down those ends a little bit or slow down the hug rushers and things of that nature so it's clear that Downing saw that they weren't doing that well enough and made that correction they've had success with it thus far the issue is that's been the primary source of their explosive plays because they don't have very many right now you have some chunk plays to Julio Jones in the Seattle game you have uh, you have some chunk plays in the screen game. This most recently on Sunday with Jeremy McNichols picking up, I think it was 27 on that third and 21, and they got the Jets with it a couple times until the Jets were like, hey, we're leaving this uncovered regularly. And in the fourth quarter in overtime, they were able to sniff out that particular screen. But for the Tennessee Titans, they need, that's a good feature to have, but it can't 
that can't be the only thing that you're hugely focused on is, and it's not like they're singularly focused on right now. They've got a very pared down playbook that they're using because of the amount of injuries that they have. But that is something that I think you're going to see with regularity and something that they've already leaned on through four games. When we come back, we will spend some time on a report I had about Jayon Brown, who's been relegated to a reserve role. Now, there are injuries involved in this, but I'll tell you why the Titans coaching staff was trending that way anyway. And Wesley Woodyard, who was on J. Martin Ramon this morning, will fill you in on some of the logic that happened when he was benched. Not that jayon has been outright benched, but certainly some similarities in that circumstance. That's on the other side. I'm Buck Rising. It's 104.5 The Zone. A.J. Brown, Bud Dupree, and Caleb Farley. You hear them on the exclusive Titan station. 104.5 The Zone.
outside Jayon Brown. There's another billboard with the other stars of the football team, Dupree, AJ, on the north side of downtown, right uh, right coming off of uh, my exit, actually, at, at Elizabeth Park. But Jayon Brown, who's a fan favorite, who has been a starter in some capacity since his rookie year under Mike Malarkey, he's been relegated to a reserve role. Now, the Titans are approaching this, and we're going to approach this in some form or fashion anyway. There was always going to be a contingency plan for Rashawn Evans, who is an unrestricted free agent coming up this offseason, for Jayon Brown, who again will be an unrestricted free agent after being won this offseason and settling for a three-year deal that was actually a one-year deal with voidable years attached, the way that so many other GMs have been doing over the past couple of off-seasons. So Jayon Brown's in a contract year. And so unfortunately for Jayon, injuries or not, the Titans coaching staff has been favoring David Long. Now this, and I, I put all the snap counts in there because when they opened the season with Arizona, Jayon played 92.5% of the defensive snaps at inside linebacker, 62 defensive snaps. He was on the injury report in week two ahead of Seattle, hamstring injury. He was questionable to play on that Friday. They ended up ruling him out on Saturday, and David Long started. That was when things started to gravitate towards David Long. Again, the injury has something to do with this, but now Mike Vrabel's riding with the hot hand. And for Jayon Brown, it's my understanding that he's frustrated by this. He's going to play a little bit. He has played in spurts, but against Seattle, David Long played 98.1% of the defensive uh, or inside linebacker snaps. Brown was a full participant on Friday before the Colts game back here in Nashville in week three. Long played 57. Brown played nine. Then last week against the Jets, 98.3% of the snaps for David Long, 19 total snaps on defense for Jayon Brown, who was a full participant all last week. Now, since then, He's back on the injury report. He didn't practice yesterday, and it was my uh, it was my understanding that the knee injury that he's now on the injury report with was a hammy, now a knee. It's an MCL sprain that happened in that 27-24 overtime loss at New York. So they value him, but in a reserve role. They're moving forward with David Long, and that decision was made over the course of while Jayon Brown Missed time due to injury. And it's, listen, it's not like it's the first time it's happened. Now, maybe fans are pissed about this because Rashawn Evans has been the most underperforming of the group. Rashawn Evans as a first-round pick is somebody that has been under much scrutiny, that was outright bad in twenty in 2020, but he's played better. Not great, not good enough to, uh, to justify the draft selection or clearly as the Titans declined his fifth-round option, He's probably not getting a second contract here. And that decision will be made over time if it's not already been made. But he's playing well enough to leave him out there. What they're seeing, or at least the difference that they're seeing between David Long when he's out there and Jayon Brown is that it's not a big enough difference for them to put Jayon Brown back in the lineup full-time when he's fully healthy, if such time ever comes. David Long is the hot hand in this particular situation. Now, because I had some people going back at me, and that's that's fine. You know, I mean, I understand why why people question reporting. I understand why people um, are skeptical of something because this has been Jayon's Jayon Brown's job for quite some time at this point, right? Nearly five years, and it was at the start of the season. But Jayon Brown's not the first player to lose his starting role while dealing with an injury because it's coach favors a hot hand approach. Now Wesley Woodyard was on J. Mart Ramon this morning and spoke to this because he's been talking to Jay on. And for those people who were saying, well, it's just due to injury, this is a wild overreaction by me, who's not reacting to this. I'm just giving you the information that I've been given and putting it in an article form and sourcing it and certainly using information that I've gotten in this regard. And... What, West, what I heard Wesley say this morning on J. Martin Ramon just confirmed that fact because he's been talking to Jay on Brown and he's been telling Jay on who's frustrated, hey, man, keep your head up right now. Yeah, man, it, it sucks. You know, it's, a, it, it's not a good day 
uh, especially when you're when you're a linebacker. And 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 I know the the, the hard work that JM put in, all the great plays that JM made. Uh, you know, it, it sucks, man, that you know coaches are, are nowadays trying to go with what they like to call a hot hand. And and to me, that's that's not always great coaching. I mean, sometimes it turns your back on leaders. But man, JM JM is a great football player. And, and it sucks that this happened in his in his uh, contract year. You know, it doesn't give him an opportunity to go out there and present himself to the uh, rest of the football league as a as a starter, as a as a well known playmaker throughout the league. And it sucks, man. And, and Jayon, to me, he was one of those quiet leaders that really never got a chance to blossom under this system, man. You know, man, I, I talked to Jayon and, and just try to keep his head up, man. He got to go out there. Not worry about what's going on, man. It's a league of of control, what you can control, and just go out there. Don't worry about things and make make plays when you get out there. You know, uh, it sucks, man, seeing Jay and I start. Of course, me, man. He was one of the reasons why I didn't I didn't sign back. Of, of course, in Tennessee because he was such a great player. I don't see what happened. I don't see what changed from then to now. You know, man, it, it sucks. You know, I know Jayon gives it all his best, and he deserves to be out there playing and starting. It's Wesley Woodyard this morning on J-Mart Ramon. So, for those people who are questioning what's happening, no, the players are talking about this amongst themselves. Wesley's just given voice to that. And I understand why fans are confused by that, because Jayon has been a better player overall than Rashawn Evans. But what it comes down to is they're playing two different positions at this point. They're both playing inside linebacker, but each inside linebacker role in this defense has different responsibilities, different obligations, and what they consider Jayon and David to be is a redundancy. So instead of going with the redundant skill set, they're opting for Jayon or excuse me, David Long over Jayon Brown at this point. Now I want I want to leave you with this because this has come up as well, and it it may well show itself throughout the course of the season. In New York, after the game, I asked David Long about the Jets and what they were doing on offense because the Jets averaging 6.6 points per game prior to putting 27 on the Titans in overtime. I wanted to know, hey, given that David is now a regular starter, were they showing you on on offense anything that you hadn't seen on film? And this was David Long's response. Uh, No, not really. Uh, not really. Uh, we knew they were going to try to run the ball, you know, protect uh, Zach, you know, Extend plays, boots, and stuff. Uh, you know, they just made plays. We we uh, have good plays here and there, and then they throw the ball up, and you know, third and long or whatever. You know, they make a play on the ball. You know, they, they like I said, they made plays and we didn't. So it, maybe it's not. It's just something to monitor, right? Just something to keep in mind. I'm not saying there's a correlation between what happened to the Titans on defense on Sunday and the fact that David Long starting. David Long can't answer for the secondary. David Long just happened to be the defensive player or one of the defensive players that they put out in front of us. But it is going to be an interesting dynamic to watch, and what it probably means is the Titans, long-term, are rolling with David Long over Jayon Brown. We'll continue this conversation coming up next. If you'd like to react to that information, you're welcome to do so. 615 737 1045 615 737 1045. And also, I'll give you a, a kind of interesting, perhaps disturbing stat about Mike Frabel's record versus rookie quarterbacks. That's up next. I'm Buck Rising. It's 1045 The Zone. Besides sports, what's the three HL's favorite thing? It's the food that goes along with sports. Very mm. yummy. And some loaded tots. And too. the tots. Asian the Zing. Asian oh, zing was that I'm, a, I'm a brisket tots girl right now. You know why you lick the sides of your ice cream sandwich? So it doesn't melt all over you. No. Usually people always say, let me get the other half of that. Yeah. You lick all the sides, they can't ask for the other half. The 3HL with Brent Doherty, Don Davenport, and Ron Slay. Today, starting at 3 on 104.5 The Zone.
role with David Long getting the majority of the starter snaps alongside Rashawn Evans for the Titans. And while we were having that conversation, one, Rashawn Evans is speaking about how David Long compliments him right now. And two, Bud Dupree was at the podium. Now, Bud Dupree, who has not played in the last two games, active against the Colts, but no snaps, uh, unavailable, just listed as out against the New York Jets this week. So Bud Dupree was asked about this particular situation by the media at the at the fence line, which is where we're conducting our interviews now. And this is what he had to say about rushing himself back from injury. Man, I feel better. Um, this is what happened to like a couple setbacks, but um, you know. Uh, Everything, everything happened for a reason, so, you know, um, just moving forward. I mean, really, just, you know, just in my um, situation. Mitchell's smart and smart for everything that could be. This is, for me, is more so my mind thinking, uh, my mind being ahead of my body. And, uh, you know, you got to let this thing like this just kind of heal. And uh, I rushed it, you know, let my pride get in the way. Um, you know, should have uh, should have waited a little longer. But, you know, I'm just so eager to get out of the field, try to new team. Oh, yeah. Very disruptive. Uh, new fans. Yeah. Just trying to make my place with the, uh, make my place with the players. And uh, get myself in the You got to put your pride down, man. Put your pride to the side and, uh, and, and, and realize that it was, it was my choice to go on the field. It was my mistake. And uh, I just got to be as smart as I can because it's a long season. And, uh, and, they, and, they, and uh, I need to be on the field. When they, when they yeah. See, uh, I'm, I'm just trying to get back as quick as I can now. You know, uh, it's only week five. We got 17 games total. Uh, I'm just trying to make sure I'm available. The boy, oh, yeah. Do the stretch when, uh, when his team is really needing it. And, uh, make sure I'm, not, I'm giving my all and not having any setbacks on the field, any injuries, limping at all. And, uh, and I know. Still, you know, game, game is different from practice. Obviously. You know, you can't really take you, you, you can't, uh, you, you can't code it. So you can't go out there and say, all right, well, this play, this is going to happen. That play, this is going to happen. It just happens all in, all, all at once. And that was the, the biggest thing that kind of, like, put pressure on my um, – stress on my on my knee. And also, you know, the number of plays that I had, you know, not taking myself out of the game once I feel pain. Let my pride get away, like I said. I take full responsibility. You know, everybody just saying take your time until you uh, – to you, um, to you uh, 100% ready to go on the field. Um because you know it is a longer season nowadays, an extra playoff game, extra extra game in the season. So uh, you know we want to be able to have our full force together for this stretch we're going through well recently, and uh, and be able to you know just come out of the end for that one goal. Is it the re- so that's Bud Dupree, and I understand that it's a little jumbled because the way that we do interviews now, they've got like four dudes on the fence line talking at one time, so you have to kind of pick your poison. But for, for those of you who are trying to who heard the majority of it, what Bud Dupree is saying is he takes responsibility for rushing himself back too soon. And now they're having to more manage him or manage him more closely. Something that Mike Vrabel brought up before the Colts game, how they were still trying to figure that out on a day to day basis. And as a result, Bud Dupree has not been available to them in an emergency capacity against Indianapolis in week three and then just flat out not available against the New York Jets this past Sunday. So something to keep in mind, something to continue to monitor, because it's not just Lawan. And people were holding Bud Dupree up as an example of somebody who's playing through that particular injury. And whether whether you're looking at how high a level Bud Dupree's playing at, he's dealing with the same kind of stuff. The difference between him and Taylor is Taylor has started all but one game. Dupree has now missed two. So at this point, you're going to see this with both of them. The scrutiny should not, even though Lawan is the easier target, and this is not to excuse the level of play of Lawan, but it is a reason. Bud Dupree and Taylor Lawan, two of the best players on the team, two of the most well-compensated players on the team, and two of the t- players on the team with the highest expectations, they're not functioning at 100% capacity. Because they're both dealing with this in their own time. 615-737-1045 is how you jump in on the conversation. Does it concern you? Are you concerned about the situation with not just one of these Titans players coming off an ACL, but now two? Now, it's something that I think people were monitoring. I mean, we talked about this enough. 
during free agency, during the offseason with both of them, right? And so why there's been such a harsh overcorrection now that you're actually seeing the results of what we spend so much time talking about. I don't know why people are shocked by what they're seeing or being so upset about what it is that they're seeing when we literally set those expectations for you all offseason long. Maybe you just weren't listening. Maybe you don't want to hear it. Maybe it doesn't matter to you because of what the paycheck that these guys get. Either way, them's the breaks. So when you're talking about this Titans pass rush, Harold Landry has been spectacular. Danico Autry has been great. You could use a little more. I'm not saying that Jeff Simmons hasn't been good. You could use greatness from Jeffrey Simmons. Because I know I, I'm blanking on the name of our guy from uh, from Memphis. I think it's Kenston. Yeah. Who has has been on this point for a while. And I think that Kenston is overreacting in how little he thinks Jeffrey Simmons is doing. But I don't disagree with him in the idea that while Bud Dupree is ailing and without Rashad Weaver and without Larell Murchison, and you can't rely on Ola Adeni to be able to be your, your best pass rusher or your most statistically effective pass rusher, you need greatness from those dudes. Jeffrey Simmons, it's a fair expectation to have of him. He's certainly not taking over games with more help than he had last season. I would say that that is, I would say that that's accurate. I would say that that's a fair assessment of Jeffrey. And you would like to see that from him. And you expect to see that from him. Just as you look at guys of similar pedigree, Chris Jones, Fletcher Cox, and Dominican Sue, uh, Vita Vea in a different role. Vita Vea is more nose tackle. But all of these guys, you're looking at and saying, yeah, you, you can hold them to the same expectation. Fletcher Cox has been in the league a lot longer. Chris Jones has been in the league a lot longer than Jeffrey Simmons, and they find ways to take over games. You can cite specific examples. I'm not saying that he's been bad. I'm not saying that he hasn't had an impact because I, I do believe that him being double teamed creates for other people. But I will tell you that there is something, there is a level of play that you need Simmons to elevate to that we just haven't quite seen yet. But while you're watching Bud Dupree and Taylor Lewan, keep in mind that this ACL thing is going to continue to be a factor, not just in the short term, but through the long haul, because it's not going to get any better the longer that they play on it. 615-737-1045 is how you jump in on the conversation. But what we're going to get into coming up next is why Vols fans are upset or why a percentage of Vols fans are upset about the kind of uniforms that Tennessee's wearing on Saturday. A vocal minority. A vocal minority, indeed. Is, is there any kind, is there any part of the Vols fan base that is not vocal? That's right, that's question. a good point. We will talk about it with former Vols offensive lineman Thomas Edwards. Coming up next, I'm Buck Rising, and this is 104.5 The Zone. J. Martin Ramon, you're part of the fam just for listening. This is more than a football talk show. You all have encouraged me through some very, very, very tough times here recently. J. Martin Ramon, tomorrow morning starting at 6 on 104.5 The Zone. Selling your home can be stressful. What's up, people? This is Ron Slate.
all the trades as well. So, <laughs> what you you couldn't think of a second thing to put in there after Jack? No, no. Just had to repeat it? <laughs> not at all. Not at all. Thanks right. for having me, though. I appreciate it. Absolutely. It's crazy you guys wanted me back on. Yeah, no, it may be dumb on our part, just given how that <laughs> just first exchange went. But it's gonna it, listen. We sink into the dumb because we are inherently a dumb show, and that is the place that we like to exist. So uh, let's talk about something else that's dumb. Um, they're going to wear all black uniforms except for white helmets, which a uh, different matter entirely. They're wearing the blackout, the dark mode unis against South Carolina. And there is a contingent of this fan base, Thomas, that is fighting me, that is fighting me about this. <laughs> Every other damn college in college football does the blackout uniforms. Recruit, recruits love the blackout uniforms. The kids oh, yeah. are excited to play in the all black uniforms except for the white helmets. Why the hell Am I arguing about what color uniforms Tennessee is going to wear against South Carolina on Saturday? That's a great question. I think that's the best. That's the, the most important thing is why do we care that much? I think they look sick, you know, and after watching the, the Twitter video of the team's reaction and seeing how much they like it, that's immediately enough for me to like them. You know, if, if the team that's that's in there doing the work is jumping up and down for joy when they're seeing these things, then it's good for me. Also, I saw a lot of people upset that we're wearing them this weekend and not next weekend. And I think that's a, just a, a misunderstanding of momentum. You know, we got we got the first glimpse of momentum of a season so far. And, they, you know, we, we pull out these black uniforms that people have been asking for. Then immediately the first thing is people are saying is, oh, wear them next week. Tradition. Wear them next week. Tradition. <laughs> you can't wear a tradition. What, what, what has tradition gotten you in the last 15 years? Somebody make this make sense. Now, Thomas, you understand – not attacking you personally. I'm not attacking the Vols tradition. I'm attacking these people who I don't believe. I'm not going to call them dumb, but I'm going to say that they are displaying the behavior of somebody who is dumb that would cite tradition as why you need to wear a certain color uniform. When what has tradition bought you other than coaching scandal in the last calendar year and Philip Fulmer having oh. to retire or you know whatever happened there? Oh well, I mean, I think the tradition of Tennessee is is awesome. It's unreal. Um, I think that's so deep that. If you change the if you change the jerseys, I, I think that's just one one thing, you know. And and to your point, though, you know, switching things up is good. You know, we want to see, and I'll always resort it resort it back to if the people that are in there working out every day, practicing to play, like these uniforms, then we should like them as a fan base. You know, if it makes them excited, it makes them you know charged up, ready to go, see something new. You know, I like it. And as far as the white helmet thing, I mean. At least they got the black outlines on the around the T and the stripe. I I appreciate both of those. You know, I'm all in for them. You not not necessarily because of my own opinion, just because how I see the team react to them, and how they like them. That's all that matters, unless it's the smoky grays, and then kill those with fire. Right? That's that's the whole <laughs> that's the whole conversation. Well, hey, now Thomas wore the smoky grays. No, I, I did. I, I did. know. That's why I brought it up. I did, and guess what? They didn't get dirty at all because I didn't see a single second in the game. So. <laughs> That's you know, okay. they're, they're, they're pretty nice smoky gray, especially when they stay clean. Yeah, big fan. So let's talk about this Vols offense so far. I know you've been watching closely. You've been watching passionately. Um, and you have been, I think, I think, well, let me not speak for you. What? How, how are you through, what now, five games? How have you kind of experienced the at least the offense on, oh, yeah. with I, Josh Heupel as the head coach? Has, been, has this been surprising to you? Have you been, have your expectations been low to where anything is gravy at this point? What's been your experience? So that's a great question. And it's also, I could, I could talk about this for an hour. You know, the, I think the the biggest thing for me going into the season was, and, and really all my answers are going to result back to the same thing is, you know, how, how are players reacting to the new coach? And, you know, everything I've heard is, you know, very positive about who coach Heupel is and how he's working. You know, I think Tennessee football and any football, in general is a roller coaster of emotion and you got to understand that you know one week you're gonna you're gonna see something that makes you really angry and the next week you're gonna make you see something that makes you really happy so you just got to understand that and take it all in and it's you know football is incremental improvement and the people that are playing their best and will continue to play their best get better every week and you know for what it's worth Tennessee has done that last weekend you know that was an, an awesome show I mean it was that was a fun to watch football game and that's what's got people fired up this week and back to what I was saying about momentum, I mean, like that's that last game was really the true kickstart of momentum for us. And to be able to see, you know, us respond and hang 60 up on the board, that's awesome. I mean, and and another thing is just 
the thing that blows me away is how much those big offensive linemen are running down the field. Woo! And I just, I think about when I was in football and if you had to tell me that I was going to run a 16 play drive and we're going to run 90 plays a game plus, you know, I would have said you're crazy and probably turned around, but the, and I wouldn't have done that. You know, I don't quit, you know, I don't quit. But the, uh, <laughs> but, Noted quitter yeah. Thomas Edwards here with us. On yeah, that's right. You know, just, yeah, that's exactly right. Just take the, all this interview, take that one snippet right there. That's what, Hey, I'm in media, baby. Sometimes that's what you got to do to get the job done. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, so you guys did a little bit of that under Butch though. Like there was some tempo or at least there was some practicing of tempo there and it's it's clearly you know if you're if you're talent deficient it can be an advantage to you but i mean just talk about the kind of toll that it takes specifically on guys up front where you're trying to sustain throughout the course of a 60 minute performance and the advantage is supposed to be in your favor in the second half but if all your guys are gassed then you're be, you're working counterproductively uh towards your ultimate goal and trying to finish out the game finish out the opponent in that manner yeah, uh, absolutely. It's, it surely is, you know, it's a balancing act for your offensive line. You know, you have to be able to be in shape, but also, you know, you get back to my days and coach Jones era, we had people that were 270, 280 pounds, you know, playing no line and, you know, they're scrapping and getting the job done, but, you know, to really succeed and, and run a power, powerful offense in the sec, you got to have some meaty people on the O line and those people also got to be able to run too. So, I mean, it absolutely wears you out playing a game at high speed like that. And we had Coach Pajakian, uh, when Coach Jones first came to, to UT, he was all about speed. I mean, he would, he'd be running to the, from his coach's office to team meeting room just yelling speed. So, I mean, it's, it's also something that they just kind of pump down your throat, too, as a coaching staff. Like, everything they're doing is going to be fast to get you ready for that. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, uh, tired O-linemen make mistakes. And when you make mistakes as an O-lineman, it's ruthless. And it's a, it's a thankless position too. So not only do you have to be physically in shape, you got to realize, you know, how to react and respond when your body is not doing what your brain is telling it to do. I mean, when your legs are weighing 150 pounds a piece, trying to go on this play 12, play 13, you know, you got to really snap into it and, and understand what's going on. So definitely takes a toll on you. Just ask Florida's offensive lineman who had eight false starts on third and fourth down, five of them on third and fourth down, eight total false starts after, you know, basically having the ball for 40 minutes and only putting up 13 points. The execution where it was starting to yes. wear on them against the mighty Kentucky tackle cats on That's Saturday. right. And Kroger Field, hey, Kroger Field was rocking, baby. <laughs> 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 we've been making fun of it all week oh, wait, what, what yeah. do i do with kroger field what kind of intimidation <laughs> is kroger field no kroger is where i go to get my eggs on saturday morning not where i go to to face a uh, a world beating team with the you know in those blue those awful blue checkerboards people are gonna hate people are gonna just bury me because we do have some kentucky fans in the audience that love yeah. to just feast upon any opportunity that they can given that i went to indiana but no, there's nothing scary to me about Kroger Field, and yet Dan Mullen fell flat on his face there. Oh, man, I, it, it was such a great game to watch. I mean, honestly, I'm not too partial to either of those teams. Sure. Expect, I mean, in Florida, traditionally, and then recent years, Kentucky. Um, but it was just great. It was great to see a little shaking. But, hey, honestly, let me tell you a little story. One time we played Kentucky, and it was a home game. I didn't travel with the team. I was, you know, I was, I was a walk-on, you know, just development kind of thing. Went out the night before to a sorority formal with my girlfriend at the time, you know, had a good night. And then the next day, you know, when you didn't travel with the team, you had, you had to get your own transportation to the state no. <laughs> on Saturday. No. So, you know, so I uh, got dropped off, went to the game. We're playing Kentucky. Um, so where we whop them, it's, you know, we're beating them a lot in the first half. And turns out I play the entire second half oh. and didn't travel with the team. So, I mean, that morning I drank a can of Coke and had two pop tarts and played an entire <laughs> half SEC football and I did well. So, I mean, let's to go full circle with that. Um, it's pretty surprising that to see Kentucky beat Florida. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. Well, I mean, listen, K Kentucky deserves, deserves a tiny bit of credit in the last couple of years. Cause they have been, I mean, they have found a way to make that into a legitimate football program. And that's not something that I'd, I never thought I would say into a microphone yeah. as a sports talk professional. I, I have a similar <laughs> story from, from high school football. Obviously, you know, I don't, I'm not, I was never an athlete in my life. 
I was a scrub for the major the vast majority of my high school football career. Like my junior year, we played a team from Central Indiana, just just wretched. There was I think we ended up beating them by nearly seventy points, and it was I was not playing any any role whatsoever at the time. <laughs> On the football team, and it's like the second quarter. I've just eaten two, like two Philly cheesesteaks from Subway or something like that because I was like, ah, I'm not going to need to do anything today. Hey, what, what am I going to do? I'm going to hang out. I'm just going to, you know, gorge myself on God knows what. Um, and and I and my D line coach comes up to me. Is like, hey, you ready? I'm like, now? What do you mean now? <laughs> I don't want to go out there now. I'm going to cramp up. I'm going to throw up on one of these. Poor, terrible, you know, 180-pound high school football offensive lineman. And sure enough, I did. It was a bad experience. You did. You threw up. Who's yep. getting oh. Philly cheesesteaks at Subway? Yeah, uh, I know. That's your first mistake. Well, listen, there was not a lot of great choices made, which is wh- why I did not contribute a lot in my athletic career. But, uh, yes, it is It is not the place that you consider, <laughs> to, consider to be the new Death Valley, Kroger Field in Lexington, Kentucky. Um, let's, yeah, let's talk about the SEC East, though, Thomas, because with – and Thomas Edwards, former uh, Vols offensive lineman here with us on 104.5 The Zone. Let's talk about where you think – where you see the Vols stacking up in this East because we just saw Missouri and the atrocities that they're committing on defense right now. They are not a very good football team. Um, you have South Carolina. You have Kentucky in your future. Where do you think that this Vols team right now stacks up against the rest of the competition not named Georgia and even as they had a, a bit of a downfall, Florida? That's a good question. I think um, there's a lot of a lot of movement right now. Um, one team that's not moving is Vanderbilt, but the other teams Woo! that are um, big win on Saturday for the for the Commodores. Huge win, huge win. <laughs> yeah. You could you could talk to your friend across the stadium if you wanted to. There's so few people <laughs> in that stadium. Um, the uh, I don't, I think it's going to be competitive. I think, you know, uh, the thing about the sec is, you know, no matter how much you can sit here and talk about one team or the other, there's always going to be one team that wins a game. They're not supposed to, I wouldn't even say that was Kentucky last weekend. I mean, Kentucky's, that was a good ramp up. They've had us, they've had a nice ramp up and, you know, they haven't beat Florida and I don't know how long and they finally did. So Kentucky's going to continue to do well. They had a coach that's in this, that's been in the same spot for a while. He's had the opportunity to get his own players there and, and develop them. And that's a big thing that, uh, that a lot of programs, you know, that's what makes them successful in longevity of a coach is do you have the people that the coach actually recruited on the team? Like right now, Hypel has nobody. I don't really know how many people he has that he recorded or recruited on his team. So, I mean, that as a coach too, you have to develop that. And sometimes we overlook that and we want the, that quick, quick and easy button, just throw it down the field to that receiver. You know, he's good. He was good last year. Right. Sometimes it just doesn't work out. But I, I think, okay, so as far as it shakes out, you know, South Carolina, I think that they're nothing to shake. They're uh, nothing that special. I think we can, you know, Tennessee can conquer them this weekend with pretty much ease. I mean, they were starting a cafeteria worker their first game at quarterback. <laughs> and so when they ran out. So, I mean, that's that's fine, though. I mean, you know, it, it's all about incremental improvement. They're not starting. He's That's probably not the same guy. They're probably changed every week, and they're different, and they're better. Um, you know, obviously, Georgia's going to be a very, very hard game to beat. Uh, they're a very good team. Their defense is the best I've seen it in a long time. Um, but really, I think, you know, I, I think we definitely have a, sh- a standing shot. You know, it's all about momentum, too. And that's where those black jerseys come in this weekend. It's a noon game. Nobody wants to be there at noon. You know, there's a reason why we, we practice this whole season in the morning because, you know, Hypo and them knew we were going to face noon games this year. Um, you know, playing and playing at noon is not fun for the players and it's really not fun for the fans either. But um, it, that's what makes it interesting. You know, I think, you know, really the SEC is going to shake out to, you know, who's who can continually get better down the road, who can get better each week, who can keep playing better. Um, but Kentucky's going to be hard. Kentucky's going to be a hard one to get past uh, the way they're playing last week and, you know, just moving forward. But hopefully, hopefully, I mean, I just like, you know, my bias says Tennessee's the best every time. As long, long as they eat Pop Tarts and Coke for that pregame meal against South Carolina, it'd be easy to get up for us. 6 a.m. <laughs> yeah, or whatever yeah. that pregame meal is. I think they're eating like yeah, fettuccine dude. at 6 a.m. Yeah, that's right. And the biggest thing is like people think like, you know, like Macho Man about to play some football or about to get fueled up. Like, you know, come on. I'm just, yeah, they're just dudes, you know? So there's probably, you know, I saw a video the other day of somebody on Twitter eating a whole plate of beans before he goes and plays a game, just like <laughs> an entire like dining room oh. size plate full of baked beans. <laughs> and you're like, whatever floats your boat, you know, it's not, it's a, well, 
there's a, there's a recipe, but you hmm. brought up the bringing out the black jerseys for South Carolina instead of Ole Miss. Where Ole Miss, it's a night game. Lane Kiffin, who was the first to bring out the black jerseys, is back in Neyland Stadium, and the whole nine yards. You know, it's the energy to maybe try to upset a Rebels team that's currently better than you. But they're only out for a noon kickoff against South Carolina, a team they should beat. So you like that approach, right? Like, what does that t- actually tangibly do for a football team? Do you remember that reaction when they first brought out? the smoky grays when you guys were in the locker room like does that have oh, as much yeah. of an effect as people think it does absolutely i think um you know i think and even for a, a school that's as rich as tradition as tennessee is seeing differences from a player standpoint you know seeing that change in uniform seeing that you know they the players understand the tradition very well you know it's it's you're talk you're talk they talk about it the entire time you're there you know about what tennessee is and how it became to be and to see, uh, you know, a change like that is huge. And to know that your team is the one that's part of that is huge. Um, I think it's very important that I, I, I like the rollout that they did against South Carolina because, you know, next week at Ole Miss, that game's going to be sold out. It's a night game in Neyland. Lane Kiffin's coming back. Um, this game this week was an enigma because it's noon and it's South Carolina. And they needed a little more push to make sure people were going to be in there and sell the game out because Neyland makes a huge difference in the game. And, and I totally agree with wearing them. Shoot, I, I, I think any time is a good time. But you know, to capitalize off the momentum of a big win, where our off, our offense put a lot of points on the board, you got a lot of people talking, and not a lot of negative this week. You know, maybe next week when, <laughs> whenever there's something else to talk negative about. But I think that you know the momentum from the jerseys is going to be a good thing too, just to, to bring them out on Saturday. Lebowski wants to know what kind of PC in the YouTube chat where you can interact with the show: Facebook Live, YouTube, Twitter, Twitch. Uh, Lebowski says, ask Thomas what kind of PC build he's rocking. You look to be in some kind of like gamer war room right now. Yeah. So watching on zone TV. Yeah. So, uh, this is my little home studio. This is where I make my music and stream some games. Like I said, Jack of all trades, master of all trades. Um, so, you know, I do a bunch of stuff in here, you know, but so what kind of build is it? um I did, you don't about, have a, you don't actually have to tell us unless you want to you can go through no it. i'm not going to i have no clue it's about two feet tall ah. it's about six inches wide someone else made it for me so <laughs> it works fast and it works fast <laughs> very good you can check out thomas edwards new single by the way on spotify be around it's available wherever you get your music right now check it out well worth your time if you got about three and a half minutes to kill the car give our man a listen he's he's making some pretty cool stuff as the uh, Buck Rising Show resident renaissance man, former t- uh, Tennessee offensive lineman Thomas Edwards has been our guest here on 104.5 The Zone. Thanks, buddy. Yeah, thank you guys. Make sure to listen to that song. My life depends on it. No, very good. Do that. Do that or else Thomas will die. That is basically <laughs> the that we will leave you with. Polls coming up next. Friday night, it's Independence at Summit in the 104.5 The Zone Game of the Week. Presented by the Tennessee Highway Safety Office and Paul Winkler Investing. Coverage starts Friday night at 6.30 with Will Bowling and Lucas Panzica on your home for high school football. 104.5 The Zone. What's going on? It's Will Bowling, NFL.
This has never stopped anyway. We all make mistakes. We are all sinners. If you think you aren't, then cast the first stone. To my wonderful followers, friends, thank you for your support, love, friendship, laughs. I will miss this the most. I love you all and wish God's blessings on you. Thank you. Hashtag faith, family, football, flamingos. Because apparently she's a big Flamingos fan. <laughs> God, Urban. Urban, man. Make your wife delete her Twitter account. See what you did? Look what you did. Liam Neeson. Should Shelly Meyer have to delete her Twitter account because her husband appears to be the worst? No. Yeah, but she probably needs to. I mean, God knows what people Oh, she absolutely needs to. Ugh. Because of Urban. Well, yeah, this is his fault. I mean, at... <laughs> I I just wonder, and it's none of my business, right, what goes on in their marriage, but you have the pictures coming out on social media of that ridiculous coffee table with a thousand and one uh, framed photographs on it. Like, it looks, it looks like, and again, it's none of my business, but it looks like the home <laughs> of a hoarder. You know what I'm saying? You think you rage flipped it? Uh, frames every, flying all over the urban household? I would say that it would... No, she got some fact, power behind it too. It, that it, one photo went like twenty feet. I, what I'm saying is, I don't think I don't think you could physically lift that. There's too much weight. <laughs> I don't on know. The you table. get mad enough. I mean, it's just straight up Hulk rage. Look what you did, Urban. Look at it. <laughs> I want to make so many jokes right now, but I honest, I feel deeply inappropriate making these jokes at the at the expense of the Meyer family because I feel bad. I feel bad because Urban sucks. All right, that's all I got on the Urban Meyer situation. Until he does something next. Polls. I don't know who you are, but I know what it's time for. A poll update on the Buck Rising Show. Here's a young man with a very particular set of skills. With the final numbers, here's Buck Rising Show correspondent and producer, Lucas Pansica. By the way, Spencer has given us a 6-9 on the day. Nice. Nice. Over a 1,000 votes on this one. Who do you want starting at inside linebacker? And the majority want to ride with the hot hand like Mike Vrabel. 61% oh. say David Long over Jayon Brown. Interesting. That, I would not have expected that. But that's good news for you if you are somebody who voted in favor of David Long because that's what they're doing while Jayon, Bear, uh, while Jayon Brown rehabilitates from an MCL sprain. Mike Vrabel's 0-4 record against rookie quarterbacks. Coincidence or legitimate trend? 51% say coincidence. 49% say legit trend. Hmm. We will spend more time on that tomorrow because that's not something. That's something I had prepared today. The statistics on, I mean, the numbers are ridiculous, especially when you consider that they're playing a ton of rookie quarterbacks this year. Jack Urban, or excuse me, Trevor Lawrence twice, Davis Mills twice, Zach Wilson once, obviously loss. And then you have Mac Jones, potentially Trey Lance, right. left on the schedule as well. So the four are Josh Allen, obviously Zach Wilson, Joe Burrow last season, and Gardner Minshew. That's right. The mustache got one over on him in 2019 at we Jacksonville in week three. The worst game. Oh, no, no. The Broncos, the, the game where they bench Marcus Mariota is the worst football game I've ever watched. And they played some god-awful ones uh, in my five years here. And then, ironically enough, they win in the god-awful football games, most of them. Anyway, but the, the Minshew week three, Thursday night football, NFL Network saying, hey, let's just get this bleep out of the way right now. You needed windshield wipers in the press box in Jacksonville because it was storming. It leaked on my laptop. I will never forgive the city of Jacksonville for how gross that stadium is. Well, look, no matter high, how high the flames of the Jacksonville dumpster fire rise, Trevor Lawrence is going to get somebody this year. He's going to get somebody. Oh, boy. 21 people on the injury report, 34 players dealing with some form of malady for the Tennessee Titans. Could it be Tennessee? Who do you think is leading the Titans in receptions? 39% believed it to be Jeremy McNichols, which is correct. 36% said Derrick Henry, which is the second most. 19% said Chester Rogers. 6% said Julio Jones. All right, so 39% of you looked that up beforehand because well, there's no way. 100% looked it up because it was all in the exact correct order. Liars, all of you. It's fine. I still love you. Balls, black jerseys, yes or no? 78% say yes. Uh, yes. I, I mean, you know, it's not. I, I think there's some kind of COVID restriction. That doesn't allow them to wear a black helmet with that? No, it was actually Jason Swain reported it yesterday. It was a supply chain issue. They were going to have <laughs> black helmets. 
and a supply chain issue. It fell through. But honestly, I think the white helmets with kind of the black outline around the power T and around the stripe looks a little bit better. Uh, I would rather have it be, you know, I would rather the uniforms be uniform. You know what I'm saying? Right. I think majority of people are on board with it because I think majority have the correct opinion that if players and recruits like it, then it literally doesn't matter what you think or any of the fans. It's think. not about you, Leroy, in Lebanon. <laughs> Leroy. I mean, I don't know. Sorry, uh, sorry to anybody. The most in Lebanon laughable Leroy, argument to that. The most laughable argument. Will Bowling and I discussed this on the UT podcast. Oh, is his the most laughable right argument? No, no, no. Will and I agreed on. But the most laughable I've heard is, oh, well, Alabama and Penn State don't, don't need these gimmicks. Because they have championships. Yeah, they don't. They don't need the. They don't need the help of a uniform to get recruits. Have you looked at Tennessee recruiting lately? You need all the help you can get in recruiting because it's not like there's anything happening there. It's pretty quiet right now, which is a concern for another day. Is the Titans injury report the longest you've ever seen? Ninety-five uh, percent say yes. Jason Martin of J. Martin Ramon had this correct. We should have made it. What's longer, a CVS receipt <laughs> or the Titans injury report? And I think it might be the Titans injury report. 21 names yesterday. Uh, the latest the latest in Titans maladies comes your way at, I believe, 3 p.m. Central Time when such things are updated. Those are the polls? Those are the polls. Very good. Fun show today. If you missed any of it, check it out in your favorite podcast app, The Buck Rising Show. A lot of good interviews, a lot of good conversations that were had. Uh, we will be back at it tomorrow. We will have Coach Dave McGinnis. We will have King John Reed. We will dive more into detail of what has happened with Mike Vrabel versus rookie quarterbacks to this point in his career. And we will get you ready for the game at Jacksonville and also for the Vols against South Carolina. Do it again tomorrow. In the meantime, Lane and Mickey. Titans game with you. Put your seatbelt on and let's do this thing. Let's do this thing is right. Get every game by.